Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live. I'm Joe Lynch. I am here with the state delegation update. Once again, joined by State Representative Christine Barber. Representative Barber has a very special guest today, Harris Grumman. Harris is the Executive Director of SEIC, the State Council. He is also one of the co-founders of Raise Up, an initiative to um, assist, protect, and these grassroots organizations are really, in my opinion, this is the way to go these days. So Representative Barber, I'm just gonna ask you for a very quick uh, update on what's been happening at the State House, and then we'll turn it right over to, as a conversation between you and Harris. Sure. Thanks, Joe, and thanks so much for, for having us today. I'm really um, honored to be here, as always, and excited to have Harris Grumman join us today to talk about Raise Up. Um, so my real state house update, what we are um, working on now is, is one of the most important things that we work on every year, and that is the state budget. Um, so as um, you know, watchers of the show know, um, the state budget has been incredibly challenging this year um, because of the public health that led to the economic crisis of, um, of COVID. Um, we have been, usually the state budget comes out, it, we debated in April and it is done ideally by July 31st, but because this was such an extraordinary year, we have done one month sort of continuing budgets um, since, uh, since July, since the fiscal year started, um, because the budget has been such a challenge. So one of the things, of course, that we have been waiting on is if the federal government will come through with a package to assist states. And of course, we all know they have not yet done that. Um, and states do each year have to balance their budgets. So the state does not have an option of you know, deficit spending or um, there's a lot of things that we're not able to do that the federal government could do. Um, and we do need to balance the budget this year. So on top of that, we all know that the coronavirus has exposed so much more inequality um, in our communities. So everyone is not being affected by this the same way. Um, many people are, you know, they may be working from home, but economically they're fine. And on the other hand, people, hundreds of thousands of people have lost their jobs, have lost their businesses, um, are unable to get, some are unable to get any assistance, and people are really struggling throughout the Commonwealth. So it's not hitting people equally. Um, so what that says to the state budget, you know, the budget really is a moral document. It is where we fund education, housing and homelessness programs, food assistance, healthcare, so many things that frankly are more expensive right now because people really um, are in a, in a place of need. Um, so we are debating and, and talking about the budget at the State House um, in the next few weeks. So we're hopeful you'll see a final budget in November. Um, so now is the time to be talking about this. And um, one thing that I've partnered with Raise Up on, and the reason that Harris is here today, is to talk about our options in the budget. So there is um, about uh, what is forecasted to be a three billion to six billion dollar hole in the state budget because of declining revenues, and we only have a couple ways of addressing that. Either we have a small uh, rainy day fund that we can take some money from, um, we can make cuts to services, or we can raise taxes, and those are really the options that a state has. Um, so. In working with Raise Up, um, one of the ways that we're talking about doing this is looking at progressive taxation. So now isn't the time to be raising taxes on working people and businesses that are struggling and trying to keep the lights on. It's thinking about what's fair and equitable, and that means uh, corporate taxes on those who are still making money and taxes on wealth um, for those who are still doing well. So I'm going to turn it over to Harris and stop talking and um, talk about some for Harris to talk about what the Raise Up um, campaign is doing on progressive revenue. And we can you know, answer some questions and talk about that a little bit. But it's really critical to all of our challenges with the state budget right now. 
Sure. Uh, thanks a lot, Christine. Thanks a lot, Joe, for having me on. Um, I mean, just to, for full disclosure, since Joe threw that acronym at you, I'm the director of the Service Employees International Union of Massachusetts, Massachusetts State Council of that union. Um, just so you, because <laughs> the letters, you know, alphabet soup. But I, um, but Raise Up is, you know, SEIU was a founder of Raise Up back in 2013 with the mission to try and start to reverse the problem that was particularly severe in Massachusetts, despite our liberal and progressive uh, history of economic inequality. And uh, of course, that economic inequality has come out this summer very clearly also as racial inequality. And so we are working very hard to close those uh, gaps of, uh, of inequality. And you may be familiar, a lot of you, I'm sure, helped actually with uh, winning the $15 minimum wage, paid family medical leave, earned sick time, and, you know, the victories we've had just since 2013. Uh, during that time, we've also developed uh, a program to reverse 100 years of regressive taxation in Massachusetts by having a tax on incomes over a million dollars that's higher than what working people pay. So then along comes the pandemic and really brings out how severe this, this crisis of inequality is, you know, ratchets it way up, as any recession would, but this one particularly. And so that's put us in overdrive on the tax question, like what can we do about that uh, more quickly than the amendment to the Constitution we've been working on for the last four years. And that's, uh, that's why, you know, I mean, we're working with some general principles we've always worked with, which is that any budget cut is regressive, meaning it hurts somebody in a real way. Uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, you cut somebody's addiction recovery program, you cut a senior's services, you know, at the senior center, you cut uh, Medicaid and, you know, basic health insurance that people have, you hurt the schools and people's opportunities for the future. I mean, all of that is worse than any tax would be, frankly. Uh, but we also have had 40 years of favoring the wealthy in tax policy. And that's not just uh, individuals, that's also businesses. Just like we talk about a 1% who are the wealthiest 1% and then there's the 99% who are, you know, just getting by or even going backward. In business, that's true too. Uh, I was just talking with Joe about restaurants in Somerville. There's a 1% and there's a 99% who are really struggling to keep open and uh, you know keep people employed, keep providing services. So it cuts across all of that. It's not business versus working people. Businesses have the same uh, inequality problem that we have as a society as a whole. So we wanna do tax policy in a way that doesn't hurt people who are struggling. And uh, that means we want to do tax policy that, uh, that really acts the winners, the winners, not just in the last 40 years of, of inequality, but in this pandemic, particularly, there have been very big winners and ask them to pay something back in to help the rest of us get through this. So we do have some very good policy options. I mean, one is called GUILTY, which is a very cleverly chosen acronym. It means global uh, global intangible low taxed income. It basically is going after those uh, companies that shelter most of their profit in like the Cayman Islands. How do they do that? They buy a patent that is the gold standard for what they do in biotech or high tech, move it to the Cayman Islands in a PO box there and say all the profits went there. We don't pay them here. So luckily the federal government did set up a program that states could also do to just say, let's have a minimum tax on people who are profiting on these tax havens. And it would bring in somewhere between 50 and 400 million, we have no idea a year, because we haven't done it yet. And if we did it, I mean, it's a no brainer. Uh, people are very excited by that. Uh, we also think we should restore the corporate profit rate, uh, the tax rate to what it was in 2010, which was 9.5, it's eight now. If you're making a profit during this pandemic, you can afford to pay a little bit more. Uh, and a lot of the companies that are doing that are, of course, very big companies. They're doing extremely well. We think of Amazon, for example. <laughs> and the third is we can ask people who are making money on investments to pay a higher rate, like they used to. They used to pay 12% in Massachusetts, and now they only pay the same as the rest of us at 5%. But these are mostly wealthy investors. We can put a uh, exemption on it for seniors and people with disabilities, and that way we're only asking people who are making money in the stock market uh, to pay if they're making money, 
the, of course, the irony of this current crisis we're in is that people are making money in the stock market. <laughs> I mean, which very unusual recession when that happens, but it's true. I have a little stock portfolio that's part of my retirement plan. It's gone up since the pandemic started. I mean, that's crazy. I mean, I mean I, I'm lucky to have a roof over my head and a salary, but I mean, my stocks are going up while people are unemployed and so on. I mean, is it, this whole crisis is hitting people very unevenly. I mean, to give an example, Moderna is working on a vaccine for all of us. Harris, can, Harris, can I ask you a question before before we get into kind of the weeds on this thing? What's the easiest thing for government to do? Cut the entitlements, increase taxes on the wealthy and the corporates, or close the loopholes? What's the simplest solution that government has done in the past? Well, in tw 2002, I mean, to take state government, which is a particular case, because the federal government can borrow money in a sensible way and do deficit spending like, you know, like uh, the Joe Biden would probably do if he were elected. Uh, and we saw some of that already, even under Trump in, in the early part of this pandemic, deficit spending to just pump the economy up. And it was very helpful to businesses and workers. Um, so, you know, that's great. But at the state level, we can't do that, as Rep. Barber said. And so, you know, we, we, in 2002, we were faced with deep cuts like this with the recession of, of 2001 that started then. And we had no help from the federal government under George W. Bush. So we fought for a tax package that was mainly progressive. And uh, we won uh, what today would be a $2 billion tax package. There were no cuts to the public schools. They were level funded because of that, to give an example of the impact that had. Most of that money, 40% of it, came from the top 1% of income earners because we did it in a very progressive way, emphasizing capital gains taxes, which at that time were taxed at 0% for long term in Massachusetts. We brought that back up to the same as what a wage earner pays, 5%. And, uh, and other things like the estate tax and the charitable deductions we got rid of because those are mainly a giveaway to wealthy people who are already getting a deduction from the federal government. So we said, let's, let's uh, do that. We did that and it had a tremendously positive impact. And, and uh, you know, we need to do something like that again. It's actually quite easy to do if you have, you know, if you're aware of how politically, you know, sustainable it is. So, so can I paraphrase the answer? The, your success in the past was to increase taxes on the wealthy and the corporate. Yeah, that was, that was the greatest accomplishment I've seen in Massachusetts in my entire time, you know, 25 years of working here. And to address a recession too. I mean, and to address a deep recession, you know, and that's how you address it because the worst thing you can do is cut money that actually puts money into circulation like any kind of aid you could give people, unemployment or, you know, uh, uh, keeping a teacher hired, keeping a healthcare worker hired, all those things keep the economy stronger. It gives people money to spend and it keeps, you know, things circulating. Uh, it's also the moral thing to do. You really hurt people with cuts. Uh, if you do progressive taxation, you're not even hurting anybody who's hurting. You're, you're actually asking people who are doing well to just do their fair share, which in the state they do not do yet. We do not have a fair tax system in this state. And finally, it's, uh, it is popular with the public. I mean, we do you know surveys and things, and we have found you know, in August, people are very worried about the pandemic. Uh, they're very enthusiastic about all three of those solutions I just suggested, you know, that those are things that people in, who are elected to office don't have to be worried about doing something that will enrage people because people have come to understand how unequal our economy is and how unequal our tax system is. And it's only gotten worse, as we know, under President Trump. So let me just see if uh, on the, I want to address the three points, you know, cuts for, in, for working folks. I mean, that, that creates a whole lot more issues than it helps the budget. That's the way I've always looked at it. The increase in taxes on the wealthy and the corporate, if you've got more money and we can, we can tap into that, it's really not going to hurt your profits all that much. The closing of the tax loopholes under the state, uh, state guidelines, states can do that. I think a lot of people, when they hear closing corporate tax loopholes, their eyes glaze over because they think it's a federal government issue. But that's not necessarily true. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts 
can enact laws to close those loopholes for all of these offshore banking entities or offshore corporate entities. No, yeah, and that's, oh, well, go ahead. Sorry, that's what's proposed with this guilty uh, that Harris is talking about, this guilty corporate loophole. I actually, I filed a bill to do that. Um, and we're going to be, we're trying to push that in this budget process is that is, <clears throat> excuse me, a tax that was created at the federal level. It was actually created as part of the Trump tax cut package. Um, this was one one good piece of that, where there was um, they developed a, a method to capture some of those um, offshore profits, and the state has an option, and the state has hasn't it's so taken the option to tax those and is leaving that money on the table. Um, so it is a place where the door is open and there is a process in place for us to, um, you know, connect to the way that this uh, tax works at the federal level and um, collect state taxes. Yeah, it's simply coupling up with a federal program that already exists. I mean, it's the easiest possible policy you could enact. So Harris, when we're talking to the general public like we are today, um, it's very easy for them to understand that when they're trying to balance their own budget, their own household budget or their personal budget, they look to balance their checkbooks, right? And you can balance the checks, checkbook in a number of different ways. You can cut back on your expenses, which is what the state is looking at for 2021. They can increase their income in a number of different ways, which is what Raise Up is trying to look at. How do we increase the bank account for the state? And one of those ways is to increase the taxes on the wealthy and the corporate. And is there, are there loopholes in my own personal budgeting? Well, I have loopholes. I can tell you. I, I rationalize to myself all the time. Well, I'm going to cut over here and I'm going to try to increase my income but there's always that little loophole that I say, you know what, it won't hurt just this once if I order out four times this week. That, I think in general, that's what's happening for 2021, is that we have to figure out of those three kind of entities, what's most beneficial to the most number of people. And, and quite frankly, government all too, all too easily, government has gone after the cuts and said, we have to balance the budget, we're gonna cut services. And I don't think that, that should be on the table at all for 2021. No, no, it's a, and there's a direct history of the last 40 years of government cutting and cutting itself down. We've cut our higher public higher ed in Massachusetts by like a third over the last two decades. Uh, and that's something that people need more desperately than ever, and it costs more than ever because of those cuts. And as that money gets cut down, the money of the wealthiest 0.1% increases proportionally. So there's simply a shift of, you know, of, of capital, if you like, you know, capital and money from the public sector that we all use and depend on to a very small group of people who, you know, invested in Singapore or, you know, hide it in the Cayman Islands or, or do great things with it. I mean, the point is, that's great. You know, whatever they do with it is great if it's good for us. But handing over the public wealth to them has been very damaging. And it puts us, you know, on a, on a tighter and tighter budget without any reason for the common good. It doesn't really help the common good. So it's very, very important that we reverse that trend. And I mean, okay. the first thing to go after are the loopholes. I mean, if people are literally hiding the profits they're making, the legally hiding them, because <laughs> they, nobody looks at what they're making, you know, where they send that money. Uh, that's a terrible thing. We did enact a policy in 20, uh, 2008 to say, if you park money in, in uh, Delaware or some other low tax state, we need to know about it, because you probably should be paying taxes here on that, because you made the money here. How about- how never about done that with international. Harris, how about this? One of the things that I've noticed is that, you know, there are certain governors in this state who are all too happy to give tax credits and incentives for businesses coming back to Massachusetts. And the one that always stuck in my craw was the debacle that uh, Governor Patrick had, where he paid oodles of money in tax credits and other kind of giveaways to an, a, a corporate entity 
to relocate here in Massachusetts. And then within, I think it was a year, that, that entity pulled out of Massachusetts and we had no mechanism to claw back any of the credits that we gave them. Do you, do you think that giving tax credits to corporations to relocate here so they can generate more jobs, do you think that's effective? Oh, in fact, uh, it isn't effective either to keep companies here or to lure them in. I mean, it tends to be like keeping them here. We've had this single sales factor for manufacturing. We've lost jobs since it was enacted. It, it should have at least been keeping jobs the same. It wasn't. We lost you know, hemorrhage jobs. We did it for mutual funds. Fidelity moved tons of jobs out of state during that time and reaped the benefit of the tax break. So we don't hold people accountable to those tax breaks. It's very hard to do, and we don't even try to do it. And those are, you know, and it's the same with this offshore stuff. We should have combined reporting that includes the Cayman Islands. That actually, Rep. Cutler, one of uh, Rep. Barber's uh, colleagues, has even filed that. That would be worth, we don't know how much, you know, $1.5 billion probably in lost taxes to our state from highly profitable large corporations. But guilty is the easy, quick, way to address at least get a, a foot in the door on that and start to fix that. Brett Barber, you've been talking about um, closing the loopholes for a while. I know you, you never miss a chance when you are <laughs> addressing the public to talk about closing the loopholes. Where are you at the State House with that initiative? Um, so I filed a bill about this um, and that's, you know, um, going to the revenue committee, but honestly, the place for this policy is the budget because it's obviously a budgetary issue and one that we need in, in a budget where we have such a large gap in the, in the budget. Um, and one thing I wanted to add, I, I totally agree with what Harris is talking about, what's happened with inequality and as we've limited state spending, the wealthy have gotten wealthier. And I think the COVID uh, crisis has really exacerbated that and even sped that up. Um, so we've seen this growing inequality and, you know, we've all seen the, 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 the lines of people standing at food banks um, in, in our community. I mean, in, um, in Medford, in my district, there is a huge usage of, of food banks there in, um, a community that that is new newer for um, and the inequality has really grown since the coronavirus and at the same time we know the wealthier have gotten richer so it is really a moment to say um, you know what do we really want our commonwealth to look like and how are we going to lead and i think the way to do that is saying no we're going to not cut education we're going to not cut health care in a pandemic we're going to make sure people have you know basic food assistance basic rental assistance the things that are really critical to keeping people you know alive right now and to do that i'm fine with taxing um corporate taxing corporations taxing the wealthy and going after these loopholes that as Harris said, they are technically fairly easy to do. It's set up for this, and that is a way of, of addressing this inequality as well. So how far into the, I, I know you said that the, the bill has gone into committee. Um, that, that always sends a shiver up my spine when people tell me things have gone into a committee. Um, and I've expressed it to Harris, I've expressed this to Christine before, that in my mind, sometimes when you get things into committee, uh, it reminds me of that age old adage that a camel is actually a horse that was designed by committee. So, so where do you think that's going to wind up, Christine, in 2021? So I don't think the path for this actually is in the committee that it's, that it's in. I think it is in the budget deliberations. That is where we could actually get this policy and so we could policy. see that in 2020 we could and i think um you know the other thing to think about is, is that is a, a, a big part of what i'm talking about in the budget 2021 is half over um i am hopeful we are going to get out of it without huge disasters in the budget 2022 starts only in a few months and there is a lot more um anxiety about FY22 right now, um, and what will happen then when we've already kind of used our tricks, spent some of the money that we've had saved in the rainy day fund. And I think 
looking longer term, progressive revenue is a way to go, obviously, to keep sustaining that in the next next fiscal year as well. So one one more quick question. I want to bounce it back over to Harris. Uh, Christine, how much how much uh, hope is there up on Beacon Hill for additional funding coming from the federal government? Um, there are, I think at the moment we're planning on not getting help. Um, before we have to do this budget, because the time has come, we have to balance the budget. We can't, you know, kick the can any longer. And and um, it seems that before the November election, we're not going to get a federal deal. So that's that's what I'm hearing, and that's I think what we're planning on. I think it's a realistic assessment, Christine. Thanks for the honesty, Harris. Let's go back over to you. How can people get involved with the Raise Up initiative? Well, going to raise up MA, you know, uh, online and, you know, on the website and getting uh, plugged in as a volunteer is great. A lot of people I know in Somerville are involved. And, you know, uh, one of the things we're really doing now is community meetings with legislators and one on one meetings with legislators with between constituents and them and advocates. We've met with over a third of the legislature just on this question of progressive revenue. It's going to take some time. I mean, it'd be ideal to act early and uh, and you know make sure that we stop the cuts ahead of time. But politics doesn't work that way, as <laughs> you noted in many ways. It, it requires a lot of pressure from constituents that they be heard, that these are solutions they want, that they don't want cuts to their schools, they don't want cuts to their health care, they do want uh, a fair tax system that actually brings in enough revenue that's fair and adequate, and uh, and that we have solutions to that and and. You know, Somerville's always been a, a a real bedrock of support for progressive taxation in the state. I mean, it's one of the best, you know, grounds for it. It's one of the reasons why our delegation tend to be leading sponsors on those kinds of bills because they, well, they represent. Harris, I do suspect that you're getting um, support from the state delegation here in Somerville. Yeah. Um, very quickly, we've got about ten seconds left. W what are your hopes for getting this done in the next session? Well, I, I, necessity is is a great you know uh, thing to accomplish things. In two thousand two, we accomplished uh, you know almost you know the best tax reform since the Second World War. We are in a similar position now to do something like that to really fix our Commonwealth, not just for this crisis, but also to make the investments we need to make in like racially equitable schools and uh, you know a, a affordable public higher ed uh, and and quality health care for everyone. Great. I want to thank both of you. Harris, good to see you again. The last time we saw each other was primary night here in Somerville. I hadn't seen you in a while, but it was good to see you. And virtually, great to see you again. Yes. Representative Christine Barber, carrying on the good fight. Thank you so much for coming back in. Thank for you, Joe. Somerville Media Center, I'm Joe Lynch. Thanks for watching. Please stay safe, stay informed. See you next time.